The problem with telling your life story is, especially after 67 years, is there's so much you can tell. Going back kind of the beginning, my father was a pastor of two little rural churches in the Catskill Mountains in New York, uh, in the towns of Greenville and Grapeville. And uh, I was born at, in Catskill Hospital in Catskill, New York, uh, while he was there. And then uh, when I was, I guess, four, uh, he and my mom felt the call to go to missions. And nine months later, we were on a ship heading out of New York Harbor, uh, the original Queen Elizabeth, Queen, yeah, it was the, it, it was the original QE, it was before the QE tip. And uh, we, we sailed the, to London, and we took other ships down to Kenya, and uh, they spent the next six years in uh, Kenya, and then we came back for one year of furlough when I was in sixth grade, and then went back again, and then I came home uh, to stay at the end of my junior year. So I had my senior year of high school here in the U.S. From there I went to college in western New York, um, and my parents went back to Africa, and uh, I was kind of on my own from then on. I guess I had kindergarten when we were in Nairobi, and then I went to, I guess, first through fourth grade um, in Eldoret, Kenya, in a British school, in British schools, um, local British schools, and then when, when I was in fourth grade, um, I kind of had to repeat part of fourth grade because the, the years kind of overlapped. Yeah. Um, and so I went to uh, Rift Valley Academy in Kenya, boarding school. That was about 200 miles away. It's an eight-hour train trip. And uh, went to boarding school from then on in Africa. So I went through uh, fourth and fifth grade in, in boarding school. Then I was back here in the States for sixth grade. Then I was back in Africa for seventh through eleven. Uh, that's a complicated question. In retrospect, I know now that there was a lot of uh, implications that I wasn't aware of then. But at the time, it was just what you did. It was just what there were lots of other uh, missionary kids in that school. And they came from, some of them came from, took them a week to get home. You know, living in dorms had its drawbacks. But at the time, you know, after the first day or so, each time you went back, you were a little homesick. But quickly forgot it, and, and after that, you didn't even think about home until you, well, you did, but, you know, it was... We, we had three month terms and one month off between them. So each time we went to boarding schools for three months. And then, so you sort of forgot about home until you got near the end of the three months. Then you went home and you forgot about school for the month you went home. Well, I guess the first time I went, my folks took me. Okay. And uh, they were more bothered by it than I was, I think. <laughs> which was always the case. Um, after that, we went by train, and I had my, my brothers with me initially uh, until they later graduated in, when I was in high school and then I went on my own. Um, so, it, you know, the train was kind of fun. Well, it was later on. I was traveling with, with, with Dan, an older brother, and... Uh, I guess we were in high school then. And we were traveling on the train, and the trains, we, we always went 
second class, which meant you had an individual cabin that you had. So it was just the two of us in this little cabin. And, you know, after a few hours on the, on the train, you start to get bored and, you know, you were coming up with creative things to do. And we happened to look up and there was a fan up there. There's no air conditioning on those trains, and this is Africa, so it could get pretty hot. But they had this fan up on the corner of the room. And it was kind of a case of, I wonder what would happen if we, uh, we decided, let's see what happens if we throw a peanut butter jelly sandwich <laughs> up behind the fan. And it got in the fan and just sprayed all over the room. And everything was a sticky mess after that. <laughs> but we just sat there laughing at my uncle with the And then one time, I guess it was, with, I was on with a friend. I think that my brothers were gone. And we decided to try something. So we opened the windows and, and went back to the toilets and got a roll of toilet paper and kind of let it unspool out the window. And it worked wonderfully well. The, the, the toilet paper went way, 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 way back to the end of the train. And uh, especially cool when you went around the curve because you could look all the way back and you could see people sticking their heads out the windows watching you. With this, with this long line of toilet paper falling <laughs> until one of them kind of pointed that the conductor was coming. And so we, just, we dropped the toilet paper, closed the window, sat down, tried to look innocent. And the conductor come in, came in and kind of reamed us out. But you could tell he was kind of half chuckling too. <laughs> but uh, I guess I was in fifth grade. And it was on a Sunday, and um, normally we just had come out of the church service and we get, we're lining up to get ready to go in for lunch. And we look up the hill a little bit and we see the principal running as fast as he could. And he climbs, we had this real high bell tower, and, uh, and he climbs up and it, it's a big bell, uh, you know, maybe, I'm sure it's a couple hundred pound bell. And, uh, he goes climbing up this bell tower and he takes off his shoe and starts pounding on this bell as hard as he could. And that was an alarm bell. Uh, we didn't quite know what it was for, but it was an alarm. When, you, when it rang fast, that's an alarm bell. And uh, so everybody started wondering what's going on. And then we saw this smoke coming up above the trees. And so we, then we started hearing the yells that the, uh, the dorm, there was a dorm on fire. And it was the... Um, I guess the elementary girl's dorm was, was on fire. And that was quite far up the hill, so everybody charged up to the hill to see what was going on. And yeah, the, fire, the dorm was on fire. It had started in one corner of the dorm where there was a little apartment for, for a, uh, there was a single woman living there. And she had gone to church and left a roast in the oven um, and somehow something caught fire and caught our curtains and the dorm was on fire. Well, there's no um, fire department there. The nearest fire department's about you know, 20, 30 miles away and they wouldn't have come anyway. Um, and there was no, no way to get them there anytime soon. So, um, rat, and, and the fire extinguishers were all kind of dead and they hadn't been re up in a while. So instead of trying to put out the fire, they just had, I guess the alarm went off out across the hills and, and hundreds of people came from all over, just showed up and they ran in the building totally against any kind of fire and started pulling stuff out. And they virtually emptied the whole building in the space of maybe an hour um, while this fire slowly went from one corner of the house up into the attic and then across. And I mentioned the alarm that went out where the bells were ringing fast. That goes back to the Mau Mau days, which was a few years before that, when that whole region was embroiled in the Mau Mau War. Hmm. And I wasn't at the school myself, but my two older brothers were during the last couple of years of the Mau Mau. And at that time they had the school completely surrounded with big high 
barbed wire, rolls of barbed wire went all around the school and they tried to keep the school confined to that one building I was in. Um, there were people living around the area who had houses all over and they had a real old fashioned phone system that only worked on our, kind of our area. It wasn't in the public phone system. And it was the old crank phones on the wall. In the area. But that was their way of communicating. If something was going on, they could sound an alarm. And they had car horns on batteries tied to each house. So if something happened, they could sound the alarm with a car horn. Um, and there were uh, several times in, during that Mau Mau War where there was an attempted attack from the Mau Mau. And the alarm would go out and the alarm, you could actually hear it going across the hillsides where the Africans had a hoop, war hoop kind of thing that they would communicate with and get the message out that there was an attack going on. Well, when the, the sounding of the bell was the notification that there was something going on and that sent out the alarm across the hillsides, I think they knew it wasn't a Mau Mau attack at that time, but they knew something was happening. And that's why people came in from all over uh, to the fire. Impressive on a little kid to watch a building. That's a pretty big building. It wasn't, uh, I guess it had three floors, two or three floors, I forget. And, uh, you know, to watch that slowly burn and, and go up in flames is it's pretty, pretty, uh, a memory you can't forget, and uh, they basically all the girls were moved to residential houses around the area until they could come up with a new dorm arrangement for them. And uh, I guess they finished out the rest of the school term living in people's houses, and then uh, later on they came up with another building arrangement for them. But as I, I to say, uh, it impressed me significantly because I was living in a, a bigger building, in an older building, and you know it was hard for me to get to sleep at night because I'd look out the windows from my bunk bed and I'd see you know campfires burning here and there and everywhere, you know, because there were a lot of you know the. Uh, Africans would have fireplaces going and so on. And, or down in the valley, they would burn, burn off the grasslands and you could see you know, a, a, a swath of fire moving up the valley. And, and that was normal. Getting there. Here we call them wild, wildfires, but there they would, that's just how they cleared them in. Um, and I became very afraid of fires and I was having a hard time sleeping. And, there actually was a little fire in that in that building during that time. There was an electrical fire up in the attic, but they caught it in time before it turned to disaster. And it uh, troubled me so much that after a while, I, I uh, asked to talk to the to the the dorm mother person who was taking care of us. And asked to go in and talk to her, so she took a, took took me into her little apartment. This was after everybody else went to bed, and we talked. And uh, uh, basically, she showed me for the first time what it means to trust in Jesus, mm. and what really putting your trust in the Lord is all about. And I did, and uh, that was my first real experience with sort of knowing intimately who, who Jesus is and what trust in Him is all about. And it, it changed me immediately. Uh, suddenly the Bible came alive. I, I just enjoyed reading the Bible as a fifth grader. And I read through the Gospels and Romans and so on. And, and, uh, and it, it all made sense for the first time. Or at least it came alive. It wasn't just something I was being taught in Sunday school. Even though I had a very solid background in Sunday school in the church. Um, so that was kind of, you know, my first experience. Mm -hmm.